The Logical Aspect of Polylogism Marxian polylogism asserts that the logical structure of mind is different with the members of various social classes. Racial polylogism differs from Marxian polylogism only insofar as it ascribes to each race a peculiar logical structure of mind, and maintains that all members of a definite race, no matter what their class affiliation may be, are endowed with this peculiar logical structure. There is no need to enter here into a critique of the concepts social class and race as applied by these doctrines. It is not necessary to ask the Marxians when and how a proletarian who succeeds in joining the ranks of the bourgeoisie changes his proletarian mind into a bourgeois mind. It is superfluous to ask the racists to explain what kind of logic is peculiar to people who are not of pure racial stock. There are much more serious objections to be raised. Neither the Marxians nor the racists nor the supporters of any other brand of polylogism ever went further than to declare that the logical structure of mind is different with various classes, races, or nations. They never ventured to demonstrate precisely in what the logic of the proletarians differs from the logic of the bourgeois or in what the logic of the Aryans differs from the logic of the non-Aryans, or the logic of the Germans from the logic of the French or the British. In the eyes of the Marxians, the Ricardian theory of comparative cost is spurious, because Ricardo was a bourgeois. The German racists condemn the same theory because Ricardo was a Jew, and the German nationalists because he was an Englishman. Some German professors advanced all these three arguments together against the validity of Ricardo's teachings. However, it is not enough to reject a theory wholesale by unmasking the background of its author. What is wanted is first to expound a system of logic different from that applied by the criticized author. Then it would be necessary to examine the contested theory point by point, and to show where, in its reasoning, inferences are made which, although correct from the point of view of its author's logic, are invalid from the point of view of the proletarian, Aryan, or German logic. And finally, it should be explained what kind of conclusions the replacement of the author's vicious inferences by the correct inferences of the critic's own logic must lead to. As everybody knows, this never has been and never can be attempted by anybody. Then there is the fact that there is disagreement concerning essential problems among people belonging to the same class, race, or nation. Unfortunately, there are, say the Nazis, Germans who do not think in a correct German way. But if a German does not always necessarily think as he should, but may think in the manner of a man equipped with a non-German logic, who is to decide which German's ideas are truly German and which un-German? Says the late Professor Franz Oppenheimer, the individual errs often in looking after his interests. A class never errs in the long run. This would suggest the infallibility of a majority vote. However, the Nazis rejected decision by majority vote as manifestly un-German. The Marxians pay lip service to the democratic principle of majority vote, but whenever it comes to a test, they favor minority rule, provided it is the rule of their own party. Let us remember how Lenin dispersed by force the constituent assembly elected under the auspices of his own government by universal franchise for men and women, because only about one-fifth of its members were Bolshevik. A consistent supporter of polylogism would have to maintain that ideas are correct because their author is a member of the right class, nation, or race. But consistency is not one of their virtues. Thus, the Marxians are prepared to assign the epithet proletarian thinker to everybody whose doctrines they approve. All the others they disparage, either as foes of their class or as social traitors. Hitler was even frank enough to admit that the only method available for him to sift the true Germans from the mongrels and the aliens 
was to enunciate a genuinely German program and to see who were ready to support it. A dark-haired man whose bodily features by no means fitted the prototype of the fair-haired Aryan master race, arrogated to himself the gift of discovering the only doctrine adequate to the German mind, and of expelling from the ranks of the Germans all those who did not accept this doctrine, whatever their bodily characteristics might be. No further proof is needed of the insincerity of the whole doctrine. Marxian polylogism is an abortive makeshift to salvage the untenable doctrines of socialism. Its attempt to substitute intuition for ratiocination appeals to popular superstitions, but it is precisely this attitude that places Marxian polylogism and its offshoot, the so-called sociology of knowledge, in irreconcilable antagonism to science and reason. It is different with the polylogism of the racists. This brand of polylogism is in agreement with fashionable, although mistaken, tendencies in present-day empiricism. It is an established fact that mankind is divided into various races. The races differ in bodily features. Materialist philosophers assert that thoughts are a secretion of the brain, as bile is a secretion of the gallbladder. It would be inconsistent for them to reject beforehand the hypothesis that the thought secretion of the various races may differ in essential qualities. The fact that anatomy has not succeeded up to now in discovering anatomical differences in the brain cells of various races cannot invalidate the doctrine that the logical structure of mind is different with different races. It does not exclude the assumption that later research may discover such anatomical peculiarities. Some ethnologists tell us that it is a mistake to speak of higher and lower civilizations, and of an alleged backwardness of alien races. The civilization of various races are different from the Western civilization of the peoples of Caucasian stock, but they are not inferior. Every race has its peculiar mentality. It is faulty to apply to the civilization of any of them yardsticks abstracted from the achievements of other races. Westerners call the civilization of China an arrested civilization, and that of the inhabitants of New Guinea primitive barbarism. But the Chinese and the natives of New Guinea despise our civilization no less than we despise theirs. Such estimates are judgments of value, and hence arbitrary. Those other races have a different structure of mind. Their civilizations are adequate to their mind, as our civilization is adequate to our mind. We are incapable of comprehending that what we call backwardness does not appear such to them. It is, from the point of view of their logic, a better method of coming to a satisfactory arrangement with given natural conditions of life than is our progressivism. These ethnologists are right in emphasizing that it is not the task of a historian, and the ethnologist, too, is a historian, to express value judgments. But they are utterly mistaken in contending that these other races have been guided in their activities by motives other than those which have actuated the white race. The Asiatics and the Africans, no less than the peoples of European descent, have been eager to struggle successfully for survival, and to use reason as the foremost weapon in these endeavors. They have sought to get rid of the beasts of prey and of disease, to prevent famines, and to raise the productivity of labor. There can be no doubt that in the pursuit of these aims they have been less successful than the whites. The proof is that they are eager to profit from all achievements of the West. Those ethnologists would be right if Mongols or Africans, tormented by a painful disease, were to renounce the aid of a European doctor, because their mentality or their worldview led them to believe that it is better to suffer than to be relieved of pain. Mahatma Gandhi disavowed his whole philosophy when he entered a modern hospital to be treated for appendicitis. The North American Indians lacked the ingenuity to invent the wheel. The inhabitants of the Alps were not keen enough to construct skis, which would have rendered their hard life much more agreeable. 
Such shortcomings were not due to a mentality different from those of the races which had long since used wheels and skis. They were failures, even when judged from the point of view of the Indians and the Alpine mountaineers. However, these considerations refer only to the motives determining concrete actions, not to the only relevant problem of whether or not there exists between various races a difference in the logical structure of mind. It is precisely this that the racists assert. We may refer to what has been said in the preceding chapters about the fundamental issues of the logical structure of mind and the categorical principles of thought and action. Some additional observations will suffice to give the finishing stroke to racial polylogism and to any other brand of polylogism. The categories of human thought and action are neither arbitrary products of the human mind nor conventions. They are not outside of the universe and of the course of cosmic events. They are biological facts and have a definite function in life and reality. They are instruments in man's struggle for existence and in his endeavors to adjust himself as much as possible to the real state of the universe and to remove uneasiness as much as it is in his power to do so. They are therefore appropriate to the structure of the external world and reflect properties of the world and of reality. They work, and are, in this sense, true and valid. It is consequently incorrect to assert that a prioristic insight and pure reasoning do not convey any information about reality and the structure of the universe. The fundamental logical relations and the categories of thought and action are the ultimate source of all human knowledge. They are adequate to the structure of reality. They reveal this structure to the human mind, and in this sense they are, for man, basic ontological facts. We do not know what a superhuman intellect may think and comprehend. For man, Every cognition is conditioned by the logical structure of his mind, and implied in this structure. It is precisely the satisfactory results of the empirical sciences and their practical application that evidence this truth. Within the orbit in which human action is able to attain ends aimed at, there is no room left for agnosticism. If there had been races which had developed a different logical structure of mind, they would have failed in the use of reason as an aid in the struggle for existence. The only means for survival that could have protected them against extermination would have been their instinctive reactions. Natural selection would have eliminated those specimens of such races that tried to employ their reasoning for the direction of behavior. Alone, those individuals would have survived that relied upon instincts only. This means that only those would have had a chance to survive that did not rise above the mental level of animals. The scholars of the West have amassed an enormous amount of material concerning the high civilizations of China and India and the primitive civilizations of the Asiatic, American, Australian, and African Aborigines. It is safe to say that all that is worth knowing about these races is known. But never has any supporter of polylogism tried to use these data for a description of the allegedly different logic of these peoples and civilizations. The Individual Within Society If praxeology speaks of the solitary individual acting on his own behalf only and independent of fellow men, it does so for the sake of a better comprehension of the problems of social cooperation. We do not assert that such isolated, autarkic human beings have ever lived, and that the social stage of man's history was preceded by an age of independent individuals roaming like animals in search of food. The biological humanization of man's non-human ancestors and the emergence of the primitive social bonds were effected in the same process. Man appeared on the scene of earthly events as a social being. The isolated asocial man is a fictitious construction. Seen from the point of view of the individual, society is the great means for the attainment of all his ends. 
The preservation of society is an essential condition of any plans an individual may want to realize by any action whatever. Even the refractory delinquent, who fails to adjust his conduct to the requirements of life within the societal system of cooperation, does not want to miss any of the advantages derived from the division of labor. He does not consciously aim at the destruction of society. He wants to lay his hands on a greater portion of the jointly produced wealth than the social order assigns to him. He would feel miserable if antisocial behavior were to become universal and its inevitable outcome, the return to primitive indigence, resulted. It is illusory to maintain that individuals, in renouncing the alleged blessings of a fabulous state of nature and entering into society, have foregone some advantages, and have a fair claim to be indemnified for what they have lost. The idea that anybody would have fared better under an asocial state of mankind, and is wronged by the very existence of society, is absurd. Thanks to the higher productivity of social cooperation, the human species has multiplied far beyond the margin of subsistence offered by the conditions prevailing in ages with a rudimentary degree of the division of labor. Each man enjoys a standard of living much higher than that of his savage ancestors. The natural condition of man is extreme poverty and insecurity. It is romantic nonsense to lament the passing of the happy days of primitive barbarism. In a state of savagery, the complainants would either not have reached the age of manhood, or, if they had, they would have lacked the opportunities and amenities provided by civilization. Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Frederick Engels, if they had lived in the primitive state which they describe with nostalgic yearning, would not have enjoyed the leisure required for their studies and for the writing of their books. One of the privileges which society affords to the individual is the privilege of living in spite of sickness or physical disability. Sick animals are doomed. Their weakness handicaps them in their attempts to find food and to repel aggression on the part of other animals. Deaf, nearsighted, or crippled savages must perish. But such defects do not deprive a man of the opportunity to adjust himself to life in society. The majority of our contemporaries are afflicted with some bodily deficiencies, which biology considers pathological. Our civilization is, to a great extent, the achievement of such men. The eliminative forces of natural selection are greatly reduced under social conditions. Hence, some people say that civilization tends to deteriorate the hereditary qualities of the members of society. Such judgments are reasonable if one looks at mankind with the eyes of a breeder, intent upon raising a race of men equipped with certain qualities. But society is not a stud farm operated for the production of a definite type of men. There is no natural standard to establish what is desirable and what is undesirable in the biological evolution of man. Any standard chosen is arbitrary, purely subjective. In short, a judgment of value. The terms racial improvement and racial degeneration are meaningless when not based on definite plans for the future of mankind. It is true, civilized man is adjusted to life in society and not to that of a hunter in virgin forests. The Fable of the Mystic Communion the praxeological theory of society is assailed by the fable of the mystic communion. Society, assert the supporters of this doctrine, is not the product of man's purposeful action. It is not cooperation and division of tasks. It stems from unfathomable depths, from an urge ingrained in man's essential nature. It is, says one group, engrossment by the Spirit, which is divine reality, and participation by virtue of a unio mystica in God's power and love. Another group sees society as a biological phenomenon. It is the work of the voice of the blood, the bond uniting the offspring of common ancestors with these ancestors and with one another 
and the mystical harmony between the plowman and the soil he tills. That such psychical phenomena are really felt is true. There are people who experience the unio mystica and place this experience above everything else, and there are men who are convinced that they hear the voice of the blood and smell with heart and soul the unique scent of the cherished soil of their country. The mystical experience and the ecstatic rapture are facts which psychology must consider real, like any other psychical phenomenon. The error of the communion doctrines does not consist in their assertion that such phenomena really occur, but in the belief that they are primary facts not dependent on any rational consideration. The voice of the blood, which brings the father close to his child, was not heard by those savages who did not know the causal relation between cohabitation and pregnancy. Today, as this relation is known to everybody, a man who has full confidence in his wife's fidelity may perceive it. But if there are doubts concerning the wife's fidelity, the voice of the blood is of no use. Nobody ever ventured to assert that doubts concerning paternity could be resolved by the voice of the blood. A mother who has kept watch over her child since its birth can hear the voice of the blood. If she loses touch with the infant at an early date, she may later identify it by some bodily marks, for instance those moles and scars which once were popular with novel writers. But the blood is mute if such observations and the conclusions derived from them do not make it speak. The voice of the blood, contend the German racists, mysteriously unifies all members of the German people. But anthropology reveals the fact that the German nation is a mixture of the descendants of various races, sub-races, and strains, and not a homogeneous stock descended from a common ancestry. The recently Germanized Slav, who has only a short time since changed his paternal family name for a German-sounding name, believes that he is substantially attached to all Germans. But he does not experience any such inner urge impelling him to join the ranks of his brothers or cousins who remained Czechs or Poles. The voice of the blood is not an original and primordial phenomenon. It is prompted by rational considerations. Because a man believes that he is related to other people by a common ancestry, he develops those feelings and sentiments which are poetically described as the voice of the blood. The same is true with regard to religious ecstasy and the mysticism of the soil. The unio mystica of the devout mystic is conditioned by familiarity with the basic teachings of his religion. Only a man who has learned about the greatness and glory of God can experience direct communion with him. Mysticism of the soil is connected with the development of definite geopolitical ideas. Thus it may happen that inhabitants of the plains or the seashore include in the image of the soil with which they claim to be fervently joined and united mountain districts which are unfamiliar to them and to whose conditions they could not adapt themselves, only because this territory belongs to the political body of which they are members or would like to be members. On the other hand, they often fail to include in this image of the soil, whose voice they claim to hear, neighboring areas of a geographic structure very similar to that of their own country, if these areas happen to belong to a foreign nation. The various members of a nation or linguistic group, and the clusters they form, are not always united in friendship and goodwill. The history of every nation is a record of mutual dislike and even hatred between its subdivisions. Think of the English and the Scotch, the Yankees and the Southerners, the Prussians and the Bavarians. It was ideologies that overcame such animosities and inspired all members of a nation or linguistic group with those feelings of community and belonging together which present-day nationalists consider a natural and original phenomenon.
The mutual sexual attraction of male and female is inherent in man's animal nature and independent of any thinking and theorizing. It is permissible to call it original, vegetative, instinctive, or mysterious. There is no harm in asserting metaphorically that it makes one being out of two. We may call it a mystic communion of two bodies, a community. However, neither cohabitation nor what precedes it and follows generates social cooperation and societal modes of life. The animals, too, join together in mating but they have not developed social relations. Family life is not merely a product of sexual intercourse. It is by no means natural and necessary that parents and children live together in the way in which they do in the family. The mating relation need not result in a family organization. The human family is an outcome of thinking, planning, and acting. It is this very fact which distinguishes it radically from those animal groups which we call, per analogium, animal families. The mystical experience of communion or community is not the source of societal relations, but their product. The counterpart of the fable of the mystical communion is the fable of a natural and original repulsion between races or nations. It is asserted that an instinct teaches man to distinguish congeners from strangers, and to detest the latter. Scions of noble races abominate any contact with members of lower races. To refute this statement, one need only mention the fact of racial mixture. As there are in present-day Europe no pure stocks, we must conclude that between members of the various stocks which once settled in that continent, there was sexual attraction and not repulsion. Millions of mulattoes and other half-breeds are living counter-evidence to the assertion that there exists a natural repulsion between the various races. Like the mystical sense of communion, racial hatred is not a natural phenomenon innate in man. It is the product of ideologies. But even if such a thing as a natural and inborn hatred between various races existed, it would not render social cooperation futile and would not invalidate Ricardo's theory of association. Social cooperation has nothing to do with personal love or with a general commandment to love one another. People do not cooperate under the division of labor because they love or should love one another. They cooperate because this best serves their own interests. Neither love, nor charity, nor any other sympathetic sentiments, but rightly understood selfishness, is what originally impelled man to adjust himself to the requirements of society, to respect the rights and freedoms of his fellow men, and to substitute peaceful collaboration for enmity and conflict.